This morning, I want to um, I want to start by this kind of our last Christmas message, I think, of the season, um, and we're going to look at a a section of of scripture that I that probably didn't make it into your Christmas pageant or maybe even your Advent reading, um, but I think is significant. To get there, we're going to look at Matthew chapter one. The, but but before we do that, I want to look at the opening stanzas of all four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, and I'm just going to read really briefly the the opening. Um, uh, parts of those scriptures. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John is kind of situating his gospel in this grand picture of, the, of, of how cosmic and, and, and total God's authority is. He, um, he writes very poetic. We're going to see that actually throughout the book of John. And, and so that's how he introduces his, certainly the most poetic of the, of the four. Mark opens this way, verse 1 through 3. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Here, Mark is saying that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy um, to Isaiah. He's the Messiah who was promised in the Old Testament, and now he's going to go ahead and prove it in the rest of this gospel. Luke opens this way. Verse 1 through 4, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated carefully every, everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out to you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that have been taught. So Luke is, is writing his first off to Theophilus, and he's attempting to take more of like a private investigator's roles, to examine all the evidence very carefully about this extraordinary claim that Jesus is the Son of God. Here's Matthew, and here's how Matthew starts off his gospel. Verse 1, we're going to actually read the first 17 verses. The record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab. Amminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. David, the father, David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, Abijah the father of Asa, Asa the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham, Jotham was the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz was the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, Manasseh was the father of Amon, Amon was the father of Josiah, Josiah became the father of Jeconiah, Jeconiah and his brothers, and at the time of the deportation of Babylon. After the deportation of Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel became the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the father of Abihud. Abihud was the father of Eliakim. Eliakim was the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok. Zadok was the father of Achim, and Achim was the father of Eliad. Eliad was the father of Eliezer. Eliezer was the father of Mathon. Mathon was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph and the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David to the deportation of Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation of Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. All right. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce half those names. You don't either, so I'll just say that I got it right, okay? Um, now, you know, the, the genealogies in the Bible are just kind of universally accepted as the parts you don't have to read, right? I mean... Like, if, if you said, I read the whole Bible, but you really meant you skipped over all the genealogies in the Old Testament, that's fine, you read the whole Bible. We don't have a problem with that. There are lists of long lists of names that are hard to pronounce and the people that we largely do not know. You know, the ancient perspective, though, was very different. And I want to I key in on, on why Matthew is opening his, um, his gospel this way. I wonder how many people have decided, you know, I'm going to read the New Testament and they got to math. They started with Matthew chapter one, and then they just were like, "Nah, never mind. I'm not going to do that." Um, you know, Matthew was writing his gospel primarily to the Jews, and the Jews, um, even though we read this and we think, "What a mess! I don't even know what to make of that." The Jews, this would have been very central. They would have understood exactly what. Uh, 
uh, Matthew was, trying, was attempting to do. And the reason is because your genealogy, um, while most of us, it might be like kind of a fun thing you do as a hobby, to the Jews, it would have been very important. They would have understood this um, very, as a very important part of who you were. In fact, um, your genealogy, the people you came from, had a, had a large role to play in who you were. A couple months ago, we, I, I did a sermon on identity. And we talked about how, um, for the Jews, who your father was, the people you came from, had a lot to say about who you were. Um, even today, in several honor cultures, several Asian cultures and Korean cultures, you, you would introduce yourself with your, with your family name first, your last name first, and then your, your, your first name, or what do they call that, your first name, your surname. Is that your surname? No, your surname is your last name, right? Yeah, your given name, right, yeah, thank you, okay. Chris, pipe down, okay? If you don't know the answer, <laughs> don't get messed up. All right. <laughs> We're in it together. Um, you know, I, I was thinking about in Lord of the Rings, right? The, the main dwarf was Gimli, son of Gloin, right? So the Lord of the Rings, they have the same kind of honor culture. Is it who you come from, who your father is, is very important. For the Jews, this would have established your, your, um, uh, your, your, a lot about your destiny. What tribe you came from had to do with your inheritance and your lot that you got in the promised land. If you were um, a... A Levi, you could be, you could operate in the, from the tribe of Levi. Only the, that tribe could operate in the um, in the temple, and you had to be specifically of the tribe of Levi, of a descendant of Aaron, if you wanted to be a priest or a high priest. And so it really would have mattered. But more importantly, what Matthew is doing here is he's establishing that Jesus is the fulfillment of these Old Testament prophecies that were prophesied that the Messiah would come from the lineage of Abraham and then further from the lineage of David. There are these, these major promises that we find in the Old Testament that God says, my chosen son, my deliverer of Israel, the Messiah, is going to come both from Abraham, this covenant he made with Abraham, and a covenant he made with David. So the people reading it would have understood exactly what it was that Matthew was doing. He was establishing who Jesus was by way of his lineage. But as they were reading through that, there's part of this genealogy that would have made them sit up straight and confuse them and made them pay attention for sure. Because what we have in this genealogy, and I don't know, if, if in this long list of names, you might have missed it, but we have the mention of four different women. That would have been very uncommon. Uh, almost never do you see in genealogies women appear at all, even though we all know Everybody's got a mom and a dad. But fathers were the only ones that mattered for the passing on of this, this identity, this heritage. It was who your father was that, that mattered. This was a patriarchal society. And that was the, the most important part. But in this, we have listed Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. We have women listed along, these four women listed along with their husbands. That would have caused them to sit up and pay attention. More specifically, though, why is it these four women? There's far more women that are left out than make it into the genealogy. There's several men, almost 40, but there's only four women. Why these women? Well, they're not the most prominent women. It's not Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah that make it, and we know a lot about them. If, if, if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the patriarchs, those certainly would be the matriarchs, yet they're not mentioned here at all. But we have these four women. I want to try to look this morning at, at why it was that God deemed it important to include these four women in the opening verses of Matthew. Let's start there. Let's take them in order. We're not going to read the entire story of each of these women. We're just going to kind of give an overview. But I left, I, I put the scriptures up there if you want to investigate it more. Matthew chapter 1, verse 3 says, Judah was the father of Perez by, and Zerah by Tamar. Now, interestingly, Tamar was Judah's daughter-in-law. Judah, you remember, he's one of uh, Jacob's 12 sons. He's one of the 12 tribes of Israel. In fact, we know that Jesus is going to come from the tribe of Judah, and it's often prophetically called the Lion of Judah in the Bible. That's named after Jacob's son, Judah. Well, here it is that Judah has three sons. His first son's name is Ur. Ur marries a Canaanite woman named Tamar, Okay. Um, to, uh, uh, Ur, the Bible says, was wicked, and so the Lord killed him. 
Now, in the Old Testament, there was a, a way of dealing with um, a, a widows. And, and the problem was to be a widow in the ancient world was to be very vulnerable. It was to be um, in trouble. You had no male protection. You, had no, you couldn't um, hold lands. You, 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 were, you couldn't hold a job. You had very little ways of, of taking care of yourself. And so to be a widow was to be vulnerable. It was to be dangerous. And so the way that, that you dealt with in the Old Testament is if, if your husband had a brother, it was your brother's responsibility to marry you and, and give you offspring in, in, in order to ensure that you're taken care of. And so when God killed Ur, uh, Tamar was married to Ur's brother, Onan. Now, Onan was also an evil man. Onan understood he, wa- he married her. It was his responsibility, but he did not want to give her children. Because if he gave her children, the children of Tamar and Onan would be considered the children of Tamar and Ur. And and by being Ur's children, he would have had the right to a larger inheritance than Onan and his children would have. And so Onan was willing to have sex with her, but the Bible says that that he, he didn't want her to have children, so he spilled his seed on the ground. The Bible says this displeased the Lord, and so the Lord killed Onan. That leaves us with the third son, Shalah. Now, the problem with Shalah is that Shalah is just a boy. He's not ready to be married. And so Judah says to Tamar, he says, go home to your family, live in your family's house, and when Shalah is old enough, I'll give him to marry you. And the problem with that is that Judah had no intention of giving Shalah to her to be married. He thought, you married my son Ur, he's dead. You married my son Onan, he's dead. Shalah is all I got left. You're not getting him. And so as Shalah grew and got older and older, it became clear to Tamar that Judah was not intending to give that son to her. And so she found out that that Judah was going up to to shear his sheep. And so she dressed herself in the outfit of a prostitute, wore a veil, and went and sat by the road. When Judah came by, she seduced him and she slept with him. Now, at the end of this transaction, Judah said, I forgot my wallet. And she said, Okay, he said, I promise I'll pay you back. She said, give me your ring and your staff as a pledge that when you come back from shearing your sheep, you'll come back and and you'll give me my money. And Judah says, okay. He gives them to her. On his return, he came back. He couldn't find her. He inquired in the town, "Where's where's the prostitute from here? They said, there is no prostitute in this town. He was embarrassed and humiliated. He just kind of slunk back to his old, his old town and just forgot about it. The problem is a couple months later is that Tamar turned up pregnant. Now, this would have been a big scandal back in the day. If if you're a young woman and you come, an unmarried woman, you come home pregnant today, it's not exactly, you know, um, encouraged, right? But you're not going to be in that much trouble. Um, Tamar, though, has embarrassed not only her family, but she's embarrassed Judah's family. And Judah actually, because he was her father-in-law, he had authority over her. When they came and told Judah that she was um, pregnant, he said, this is, this is a terrible embarrassment. We're going to burn her alive. Okay? So you're probably not worried about getting burned alive. They start to get the sticks together in order to, to burn her. And, and as they bring her out, she says, I, I, before you burn me alive, I want to tell you that the father of my children is the man who these belong to. And she brought out his ring and his staff. And automatically, Judah understood that he was the one who was guilty. And to his credit, he didn't try to hide anymore or punish her. He said, in fact, you are more righteous than I am. That's the story of Tamar. That's almost all we know about her. She went on to have twins. Perez was a descendant of Jesus. The next verse is Matthew 1 through 5. It says, Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Now, Tamar was pretending to be a prostitute. Rahab actually was a prostitute. Rahab was a woman who lived in the city of Jericho. Uh, Jericho was the center of Astaroth worship. Astaroth worship was a fertility god that was a problem all throughout Israel that Israel would go after this idolatrous Canaanite god. And Rahab was a, was a ritual prostitute. Part of the Part of the worship of Astaroth was, was not only divination and fortune telling and, and, and that kind of thing, but it also meant that you would go and have um, a, a sex with one of the prostitutes that was connected as an act of worship. Well, to, uh, um, Rahab lived during the time of Joshua and the, the conquest of Canaan. And, and you guys, most of you know if, uh, from little kids, we talk about a lot that the city of Jericho is the one they marched around and the walls fell down and they destroyed it. 
Well, she lived there. Before that happened, uh, Joshua sent in two spies into Jericho to spy out the land to see what they were dealing with. The two spies stayed at Rahab's house. They were hiding out there when the king found that there were two men spying out the land, and, and he went, sent soldiers to Rahab's house, and Rahab hid them on the roof and said, they went that way. As the soldiers went off, she said, I believe in the God of Israel, and I believe if there was ever a place that was going to fall under God's, if there's a righteous God that would be worthy of falling under his destruction, it's got to be this place. Please don't forget me and, and, and how I've helped you today when, when your God delivers this city. They said, okay, put a scarlet cord outside your window and we'll tell our soldiers to skip your house. Well, Jericho fell. They sacked the city, except for Rahab's house. Rahab got protection. In fact, she converted to Judaism and came and lived among the Israelites and she married a man named Salmon. Rahab and Salmon's son was named Boaz. Boaz might stick out to you because he's connected to our third woman. The third one was Ruth. It says in Matthew 1.5, Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. Now, Ruth's story is a little bit different. She doesn't fit with the other two. Ruth was a Moabite woman. Um, there was a, 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 an Israelite family, a husband and his wife and their two sons. And they, they, there was a famine in Israel, and so they went to live in Moab. Over the course of time, the, the mother's name was Naomi, her husband uh, and her, her two children married Moabite women, uh, Orpah and Ruth, and then they all died, the husband and the two sons, widowing these three women, again, putting them in a very difficult position. Their only hope was, was possible destitution. And so or, uh, in this situation, Naomi said, Orpah and Ruth, you guys go back to your families, and I'm going to go back and, and, and try to eke out an existence in Israel. Orpah said goodbye, but Ruth said, famously said, wherever you go, I go. I'm sticking with you. And she went back with Naomi to Israel. Well, there they, were, they were just had a very um, uh, a meager existence. Um, God made a law that when you went through and harvested the grain in your field, you weren't allowed to harvest the corners and you weren't allowed to go through a second time because that way the, the poor and the indigent could go through and they could, ha they could grab whatever the late harvest was or they could grab whatever was left over. And so that's how Naomi and Ruth lived, is just by being able to, to get enough food just to survive hand to mouth. This man Boaz, though, the son or the grandson of Rahab, he looked out at his field one day and he saw Ruth and he found her to be lovely. He inquired about her. He found out that she was a woman of, of great reputation. There was also a law that, that, um, that he was able to be what was called a kinsman redeemer, he was related to, to Ruth's husband, and so he had a right to go and marry her. The entire book of Ruth is about this picture. and In fact, Boaz is a picture of Jesus and going after Ruth and redeeming her from the life that she had. He married her. I don't think I, I ever put it together before this, before working on this Bible study, that, that um, Boaz was actually the son of Rahab. I wonder when he looked out at that field and he saw Ruth, he saw a Gentile Moabite woman in a bad spot, if he, if he thought back to his own mom's story, the way that God had rescued her and that maybe kindled something in what he saw when he looked out there. The fourth woman is Bathsheba. Maybe one of the most famous, you've been, if you've been a Christian for very long, you likely know who Bathsheba is. Her story's in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Matthew 1.6 says, David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. The wife of Uriah is who she was when we first meet her. The Bible says that, that David, who had been a man after God's own heart, who God had taken to be king over Israel and had tested for many years and had passed test after test after test and trial after trial after trial, he was found faithful until really this point. The Bible says at the time when kings go out to war, David stayed home. It says that David went out on his roof and, and he was surveying his kingdom and he looked over and he, he got a glimpse of a woman who was bathing on her roof. He called his servants and he said, who is that woman? They said, that woman's name is Bathsheba. She's the wife of your servant Uriah. David said, send her to me. She came in and, and David slept with her and sent her away. I'm sure David felt bad about it, embarrassed, ashamed, 
But he thought, okay, I'll never do that again. That problem solved until Bathsheba came to him several weeks later and said, I'm late. That's a problem because Uriah is out at war with the king's army, where the king should be. And David begins to panic, and so he hatches his plan. He's going to call Uriah back under the false pretenses of giving him a report about how the war is going. And when he's home, he'll send him home to sleep with his wife, and then Uriah will, will think that the child is his. The problem is, is that Uriah is a righteous man, and so Uriah comes home, he gives the king the report, but instead of going home, he says, far be it from me to go home and enjoy my family and, and, and sleep in my house. When the king's servants are all out to war, I'll stay here. And he sleeps on the king's steps with the king's servants. Well, David really begins to panic, and so he hatches another plan. He says, okay, I'll throw a big feast, and I'll get him drunk. And when his inhibitions are down, then he'll, he'll certainly go home. That night, throws him a feast, gets Uriah drunk, and yet Uriah does the same thing. He holds fast to his integrity. And David, thinking all the things he had done are about to crumble in front of him, he hatches his final plan, which is to write a note to Joab, his commander, saying, I want you to put Uriah at the very front of the battle. And when it's the most fever pitched, I want you to pull back from him. I want you to abandon him. So he gives the note to Uriah. Uriah delivers it to Joab. That's exactly what Joab does. Joab sends a note back and says, we did what you wanted. Uriah is dead. David then goes to Bathsheba and marries her and thinks that his sin is covered up until several months later when the prophet Nathan comes to him. And Nathan tells him a whole story about a rich man and a poor man, and the rich man had taken the one lamb that the poor man had for his own selfish needs. And David becomes righteous in his indignation. He says, bring that man to me. I'm gonna destroy him. And Nathan looks him in the eyes and says, you're that man. I've given you everything you could have ever wanted. And yet you went and defiled my, me and my name and Bathsheba and Uriah. And David falls on his face and repents. That's the story of Bathsheba, though. She's the woman who committed adultery with David. And so here we have these four women. We have Tamar, we have Rahab, we have Ruth, and we have Bathsheba. Everyone would have known who these women were. All four Gentile women. Three of the four scandalized in terrible ways. Why does Matthew go out of his way to record these four women in the genealogy of Jesus? It reads like an episode of Jerry Springer. I mean, these are wild stories. If you're like under 30, uh, Jerry Springer, how do I describe it? Just kidding. You know, I've gone through and done a little bit of work on my own genealogy, and, um, and I was... I found out some things. Before we came to America, Van Meter, my last name was Van Meteren. It means it's, it's Dutch for from Meteren. It's a city in Holland. Not a city, it's a town in Holland. But, but one of my, um, my ancestors is Jacobus Van Meteren. And uh, he was one of the financiers of the Tyndale Bible and the, the Cloverdale Bible, which if you know anything about Reformation history, these were the, for the two of the first um, Bibles that were written in English, which at the time was illegal. In fact, um, Tyndale was, was burned at the stake for, for printing these Bibles. And, and my ancestor was, was one of the primary financiers of that. I'm also related to a man named Homer Van Meter. Homer Van Meter was a famous bank robber. In fact, he was in John Dillinger's gang, and uh, he, was killed. he was in and out of prison. He was, he was just a... a a derelict, and, and um, he ended up being killed in a shootout with the police. It was like 1930s. I, um, there's, a, there's a town related to our family in Iowa called Van Meter, Iowa. And uh, just recently, I was, just this last year, actually, I was like doing a little research on it, and I came to find out that Van Meter, Iowa is also famous. It's, um, it's famous for a, uh, what would you call it, like a, a famous sighting of a weird creature, called the Van Meter Visitor. I actually have a picture that was taken. This is the Van Meter Visitor. That's up there. Back in like 19, early 1900s, 1901, 1902, a bunch of people in Van Meter, Iowa, saw this kind of wild, winged, 
super tall creature that has a horn on its head that shoots some kind of powerful beam and he's bulletproof out of his head. Now that's an interesting story, but I come to find out it's actually like among like paranormal stuff, it's kind of well known. I had, nobody shared with me, apparently I don't run in those circles, but um, in Van Meter, Iowa, there is a Van Meter Visitor Festival every year. Is a, that's the thing, and uh, I got to make it out there someday, kind of, the sun comes home. Yeah, okay, you can go, Matt. Uh, we'll go together. And um, okay, so as I'm telling my story, if I'm going to explain my family history to you, I much more want to relate with Jacobus Van Meteren than I do with either Homer Van Meter or the Van Meter Visitor, Okay. We all have parts of our lives that we would rather, like the, the parts that are highlights and the parts that are lowlights, right? Why is it that as Matthew is, is, why is he highlighting these lowlights? Why is he highlighting these parts that would be shameful and embarrassing, these stories of these women that are really not ideal? Well, I think there's two primary reasons that I want to I wanna try to un, unpack a little bit this morning. The first is this. All four of these women were Gentiles, okay? Um, Tamar was a Canaanite woman. Rahab, we're not sure exactly what tribe. She was a Canaanite too. Ruth was a Moabite. It's almost certain that Bathsheba was a Hittite. All four of these women were outsiders to the people of God. They were unchosen. Now, you gotta understand, there's a, there's a, a, a dichotomy in the Bible between Gentiles and between uh, Jews, Jews were God's chosen people. Gentiles were not. Gentiles were everybody else. Now, the Jews had a big problem with the Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't think or care that much about the Jews, but the Jews cared and thought very much about the Gentiles. God had called them to be a people for his own possession, separate, come out from those other nations and be a people chosen by God just for me. In Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle Paul is unlocking what it meant to be a Gentile. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, remember that you were formerly Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. To be a Gentile was to be separate from God, alienated from his promises. You were not welcome. You were not a believer. And yet Jesus was going to come to tear down that wall. It goes on in verse 13. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of of commandments contained in ordinances so that in himself, in Christ himself, he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross. By it having been put to death the enmity, he came and preached peace to you who were far off, the Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, the Jews. For through him, both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom, you, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing to a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. This is what Christ is going to do. He's going to preach the good news, and not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. His plan is his desire is to make a church, all of his people, full of every tribe, nation, and tongue under this sun. He wants everyone to come to him. He wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of repentance. And so as Matthew is opening up this gospel, he's going to lay out the plan of God through Christ Jesus. He wants to establish early on this has always been God's mission. His heart has always been for everyone, not just the Jews. He, he doesn't want anyone to be excluded from the promises of God. So as he includes Tamar, as he, as he includes um, Rahab and Ruth and Bathsheba, he's saying even woven into the genealogy, the story of Jesus the Messiah is God's plan for redemption of the Gentiles. God's plan to tear down the dividing wall and fit everyone, his whole body together 
under Christ Jesus as a holy temple for the Spirit of God. That's a huge part of what Matthew's trying to establish, but there's a, another part of it. Is that at least three of these four women are scandalized by sexual sin. Three of these women would have been black eyes on the genealogy of Jesus. In fact, the primary thing we know about all, these, all three of these women is their sexual sin. You know, sexual sin is, is different. Sexual sin carries with it a stigma that is, is just sort of other. And this, is, this is a distinction the Bible actually makes. The Bible says that sexual sin is different from all other sin. The sexual sin, all other sins are committed outside the body, but sexual sin is committed inside the body. But, but right or wrong, we, I mean, that's right, but we even carry some, some extra baggage, some extra damage oftentimes, specifically because of, of this kind of sin, this kind of brokenness. It, it tends to carry with it more shame, more pain. And Matthew, by including these women, is pointing that out. He's bringing it out in order for us to look at it and see because he's prophetically pointing out the mission of what Jesus came to do. That Jesus was going to bring salvation to sinners. Mark 2:17 says on hearing this Jesus said to them, "It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners." Jesus's mission, his intent, the reason he was born was to come in order to save sinners. That light born in the darkness. Look, all of us are people who have lived in darkness. And God has called to come and called us out of the darkness. But we have all the lumps and bruises and dirt and messed up stuff that comes along with living in the darkness. All the brokenness, all the history of sin, all the consequences that we've suffered. It can be easy sometimes to lose sight of this. We start thinking somehow we have to get ourselves cleaned up in order to come to God. We got to get ourselves well before we can go visit the doctor. And Jesus says, that's not how it works. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The reason he came is for the broken. The reason he came is for the sinful. And, and sometimes, sometimes we, we kind of have this picture of of, of God or even the church, uh, maybe especially the church, that is this place for people who are put together. You know, we, we drive over here from our normal lives and we get out of our car and we get dressed up, or at least we would if we went to like a normal church. We don't really have, kind of like a little more of like a blue collar type place. Um, I remember when I was, when I, when I first came here, I had come from a church with pews and hymnals and steeple and all that kind of like church stuff. And I came in here as like a, it was like a warehouse this is when we met over there. It was a warehouse, and there was like a, like a dude with a Leonard Skinner t-shirt, and I just thought, like, what is this place? Like, this is not a church. We come, you know, even our church, we have greeters. You're going to walk in here, and you're going to have all kinds of smiling people. They're going to say, hello, we're so happy to see you, and you're going to come sit down a sermon. We're going to sing songs about how great God is and how wonderful he is, and you're going to go out, and people are going to say, God bless you, and, and it's great to see you, brother, and, and, and it just can give you the impression that everybody here has it all together, and then you get in your car, and you go back to your normal life. It's not like that, and it'd be easy for you to kind of start to feel like, I don't belong here. I don't fit in, but that's not what a church is. That's not the church. Now, look, I, I want to tell you, the church has got to be a place for broken people. The church has got to be a place for sick people. Here's the deal. God, God loves holiness. Don't get, it, don't get it twisted. He loves righteousness. He abhors evil. We believe in progressive sanctification. We believe that as you walk with God, you should become more sanctified. God wants to deliver and free you from sin. We believe that. But this place will be a dying place if we turn into a big uh, uh, situation, of just, uh, uh, a big congregation of just a bunch of righteous people. How many of you guys are grateful that when you came to this church, God wasn't waiting for you to get cleaned up before you came in? 
The good news of Jesus Christ is that Jesus came to save sinners. He came to save the brokenhearted. He came to save those people who have, who have, who have, who have been damaged and damaged themselves by walking in the darkness. That's his whole point. And our church in this place needs to be a place of that. But, but you know, some, we can start to transpose that on God and think, okay, God, maybe all of these people are hypocrites just like me, and, and there's actually some, some good use in coming to terms with that, that, that the, the, the shiny, happy people you see are also sinners with all their own baggage. But, but what, is, what, is, what is absolutely clear is that God is not one of them, that, that God is not a hypocrite that God is altogether holy and God is altogether lovely. And so it creates this thing where we as sinners want to maybe kind of try to hide from him. And that lasts for about a nanosecond until you realize that's a terrible strategy. You can't hide from him. Good luck with that. Good luck finding a hiding place. He knows everything. He sees everything. And so you're left with this dilemma He's a holy and perfect God, and I am a holy, defiled, and imperfect human being with nowhere to run, with no hope. And Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you were still a sinner, he went to the cross for you and he bled for you. I want to invite the band out here. Um, in, the, in the book of John is the only place we get this story. It's, um, it's the last night of Jesus' life before the crucifixion, and, and he's having the, the last supper in the upper room with his disciples, and it's just him and the twelve. And as they're, as they're coming in the room, Jesus is sitting back, and he's watching all of them. There's no servants there, nothing. And he sees them come in the room and nobody's there to wash the feet. Now, washing feet would have been a very ordinary, normal part of life because um, you, you, at that time, first off, if the, the roads weren't paved, everything was dirty, everything was dusty. Um, they didn't have sanitation like we have it today. They didn't have a trash man to come take your trash out. So the, the streets are filled of refuse. They're, they're, um, they're, they're full of waste, human waste, everything, animals. And so as you just walked through the city, just walking around, you would get filthy. You have sandals, open-toed shoes. And, and, um, and so anytime you would come in a house, you would have your feet washed. In fact, that was the, the job that was given to the lowliest servant, the worst job in the house of the servants was to wash people's feet. And so it makes sense why none of the disciples would want to do it. And so they all came in, they all started sitting down. Jesus got up and he took off his, his garment. He put on, um, uh, he, he wrapped himself in, in a linen and, and he went and got a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. And he gets to Peter. And he begins to, to stoop down to wash Peter's feet and Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? No way. No way I'm letting that happen. And that seems right. That seems like the right response. It seems like, no, no, no. Jesus, you are good and pure. You are high and lifted up. You have all the authority and power. I should wash your feet. So Peter's like, let me wash your feet. And Jesus looks at him and he says, if I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. You know, we all want to hide the dirty parts of our lives. We all want to look put together. We all want to look like we know what we're doing and, and, and we're okay. I definitely do not want you to know about my sins and weaknesses and the worst parts of who I am. I don't want you to know about the thoughts that I would never deign to utter out loud, but Jesus, he sees them all. He knows them all. He knows me completely. Every single thing I've ever done in the darkness is in the light to him. Every single thing that you have ever 
at your weakest, worst moments, thought and done are right there in front of us. And it makes sense to say, no, no, I don't want you to wash my feet. They're too dirty. That's too disgusting. Yet he says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. Because there's only one way to come to God. There's only one way to be reconciled to him. And that's through repentance of your sin and receiving the free gift of love from Jesus. That's the whole gospel. That's the good news, is that sinners can be saved. The only kind of people who can be saved are sinners. The only kind of people who can be right with God are those who are broken, are those who are dirty. Because that's who God came for. Jesus came for that person. Would you stand to your feet?